Good morning, everyone. After a very exciting conference, I think the best conference ever seen online and best conference in, of IAPC, uh, we are starting our lecture series uh, with the lecture about the pharmacal learning pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics and the, something about NACs. As I told you, these classes are very important, not only for PGs, but for us also, because it is important to learn the basics of all these medications. So whosoever is attending, if your friends have missed these classes, please ask them to join from next Monday so that they can learn the best thing and best part of all the medication which they are using. Before starting, I want to um, give you a sad news, which uh, uh, will take you a uh, little away from this uh, lecture, but it is important to share this news and uh, um, that Dr. Cynthia, whom we all know, uh, most of the people they know, but those who they don't know, she was a uh, legendary of uh, palliative medicine all over the world. Uh, she is no more. She has passed away last night. And uh, she is the backbone of uh, institutional-based palliative medicine development in India. We have started together CTC program and uh, she has left in between us and uh, we, will be, we will be keeping her legacy forward and we will take up her legacy and we will work very, very hard. So probably we will lose one minute, but uh, we, we will keep a silence for one minute and then we will start, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we will, uh, I, I, I really feel very happy and uh, I think I'm really excited that uh, this lecture series is starting. And this lecture series will be started by Karanveer. Karanveer is our third year, uh, palliative, second year palliative medicine resident, very bright student. Most of the time, he, he is always very attentive in the classes and uh, always remain, uh, Miss like always remain very uh, helpful for the patients and he is a intelligent boy and uh, moderator will be Dr. Anuja. Dr. Anuja is um, our faculty member of the department. I think the senior most uh, assistant professor of this department and she's again a very smart and uh, very intelligent girl throughout uh, her career. She has proved that she is attentive and she is very uh, Miss like she is very, um, uh, she always extend her help in the development of departmental activities. So both of them have prepared something for you to tell you about NSCS. So please go ahead and uh, you, both of you, all the best. Start. All of you should keep your question answer in the chat box and Arun is there and he will take care of the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the introduction. I am Dr. Karanveer Singh, junior resident in the Department of Palliative Medicine, Ames, New Delhi. I will be presenting on the topic NSAIDs under the guidance of Dr. Anuja, ma'am, and Dr. Sushma Bhatnagar, ma'am. So, whatever time is allotted to me, I will try to do justice to the topic. I won't go into extreme details, but we will touch on the important aspects of these drugs and know how to prescribe them rationally and know their side effects so that we can prescribe them in a good way to our patient's benefit. So beginning with the introduction, NSAIDs are one of the most commonly prescribed classes of medication for pain and inflammation. They constitute approximately five to 10% of all medications prescribed each year 
and can be obtained over the counter in many countries. So that's an important point. Since they can be obtained over the counter, they may not always be documented in the patient's drug history. So it becomes all the more important to, when we take a drug history of the patient, to avoid such drug interactions and avoid overprescribing, we need to take the drug history very uh, like meticulously. The prevalence of NSAID use in patients over 65 years of age is as high as 96% in the general practice setting. So all the geriatric age group, we need to be very careful because most of them will be taking these drugs for one reason or the other. They may be taking it without any prescription also. So all the more reason they can be missed by us if we don't look into it carefully. And they are used for a variety of conditions, including short-term and long-term treatment of pain, inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis pain, and many others like osteoarthritis. So this is the introduction regarding the drugs. Uh, we have to talk about the historical perspective when we are talking about the NSAIDs uh, so that we know how these drugs came into being in the first place. So a brief uh, historical perspective was that willow bark was used to relieve the fever since the time of Hippocrates. It was such a pre-medical era and still it was being discovered that it had such properties. Then in 1829, salicin compound was crystallized by Liru. In 1836, salicylic acid was isolated. By 1874, the salicylic acid was being industrially produced. And in 1899, then salicylic acid was modified into acetyl salicylic acid by Hoffman. And it was then patented by the pharmaceuticals, the company we know, know as Bayer Pharmaceuticals, and was then marketed as aspirin. In 1893, acetaminophen, or the most commonly drug we use, paracetamol. It was first used by Von Mering, but it was only popular... <laughs> 1949. Next slide, please. So when we talk about NSAIDs, we have to talk about prostaglandin synthesis overview. So the NSAIDs are involved in changing or modulation of this pathway. The prostaglandins are the compounds which are involved in inflammatory states. These are also implicated in tumor growth, etc. So we'll talk about this briefly. So prostaglandin is arrived uh, from the arachidonic acid, which is a precursor to the compounds like leukotrienes, prostaglandin, thromboxins. But here we will be dealing only with the prostaglandin part. So when the arachidonic acid is acted upon by the enzymes called the cyclooxygenase 1 and 2, it is then uh, changed into compounds like PGG2, PGH2, E2, I2, F2. We'll come into details in the subsequent slides. This slide just gives the overview that there are two types of enzymes, COX1, which is constitutive and working all the time at the baseline, and cyclooxygenase 2, which is non-constitutive and is promoted by cytokines, endotoxin growth factors, tumor promoters, etc. The red uh, uh, the circles in the diagram, they are showing the inhibitors of this pathway, and the inhibitors are the drugs, which we commonly call NSAIDs. So there are selective NSAIDs, selective COX-2 NSAIDs we, we are seeing and non-selective ones, which we'll be covering in the subsequent details. Next slide, please. So when we talk about NSAIDs, we have to talk about pain pathway. So we can see on the left side of the diagram when a skin is uh, affected with the lesion, here the case of a blade, there are a huge variety of mediators which are released due to the inflammatory response. One of the mediators here is the prostaglandins. So the prostaglandins are released. These are the chemical mediators. Now these are picked up by the efferent nerve endings and they are related via the dorsal root ganglion neuron into the spinal cord. And on the right side, we can see how these tracts, they ascend via the anterior lateral system from the spinal cord to the medulla, to the pons, to the midbrain, and finally to the ventroposterior lateral thalamus nuclei and thereby relaying to the somatosensory cortex, area 312 of the brain, and how a chemical mediator is felt as a pain sensation in the pathway. The system is so elaborate and beautiful, and we are just dealing with one part of this system, and we are co clinically correlating in the subsequent slides. Next slide, please. So cyclooxygenase enzymes are also called as prostaglandin GH synthesis, and the products of these enzymes are called prostanoids, two distinct isoforms, COX1 and 2, with sequential cyclooxygenase and peroxidase activities exist. So first step is cyclooxygenation, 
the next step is peroxidation cox1 is expressed constitutively for most housekeeping functions and cox2 is upregulated by cytokines shear stress growth factors and it's believed to be the principal source of prostaglandin formation in inflammatory states and cancer also there is a 61% amino acid identity between these two isoforms and they are inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum of the cell next slide so this diagram shows the arachidonic acid how it is changed into the variety of compounds we call as the pgi2 e2 f2 all these are there, there's no need to be scared of these compounds the structure is named based upon the side chains of the cyclopentane rings so these cyclopentane rings are substitutes of these rings are what decide the names and these compounds are converted into their respective forms at the end organ site for example thromboxane a2 is by cyclooxygenase and peroxidase activity will be the same so g2 and h2 will be formed everywhere but depending upon further where the prostaglandin has to act it will be converted into a different prostaglandin and the side chains will differ accordingly so here we can also see the conversion and we can see the inhibition of the pathway by the cox1 enzyme and 2 enzyme by the nsaids Uh, next slide please so uh, please hold on uh, i would just like to again summarize uh, the physiology because uh, it's important that we understand the physiology and the mechanism of action of nsaids so predominantly nsaids work uh, by the cyclooxygenase pathway uh, as far as our uh, analgesics is concerned cox1 enzyme and cox2 enzyme so cox1 is physiologically produced in a normal state cox2 enzyme is more predominantly produced when there is an inflammation or an injury so uh, th that is how the nsaids will work by inhibiting these enzymes now these enzymes uh, uh, the substrates that are produced after arachidonic acid prostaglandins i2 e2 h2 like how karan veer has said these have different mechanisms these have different actions on different organs for example in gi tract they uh, protect the mucosa they are anti secretory and um, uh, in kidneys they regulate the renal blood flow uh, uh, so when you are using nsaids these physiological actions have to be kept in mind because when you are um, altering the physiology this might affect the concerned organ uh, karan me please go ahead thank you ma'am uh, so uh, now classifying nsaids they can be classified based on their chemical groups like some of them are salicylic acids acetic acids propionic acids and so on and so forth uh, which is not as useful clinically to us they can be uh, classified according to the selectivity of the cyclooxygenase enzyme so there can be predominantly cox1 inhibitors like ketorolac flubiprofen there can be a non selective ones which are majority of the drugs seen in the list and on the other end of the spectrum we have predominantly cox2 selective which include the rofecoxib ectoricoxib lumiracoxib and according to the half life also these drugs can be classified the drugs like diclofenac and ketoprofen have short half lives about 1 to 2 hours only whereas on the other end of the spectrum we have drugs like nabutamon and pyroxicam which have half lives ranging from 30 to even 60 hours so these are the classification of nsaids next slide please so coming on to general properties which we have to keep in mind while prescribing any nsaid that nsaids are competitive or non competitive or mixed reversible inhibitors of cyclooxygenase enzyme so we have to keep in mind that all of these are reversible inhibitors except aspirin which is irreversible inhibitor we'll come on to the detail part of aspirin later and we have to remember that majority are organic acids we saw the diagram in which cooh group was attached to everything so they are organic acids with relatively low pka values the clinical implication of this is that if there is a uh, organic acid with a relatively low pka value it will dissolve better in a acidic environment so in the stomach these will have a good oral absorption and in the sites of inflammation where the ph drops they will have a good accumulation the side effect also then stems from this that in the stomach due to good solubility they may have a chance of penetrating the mucosa cells and then damaging them also directly and they are highly bound to plasma proteins the point important to remember is that they are not they are removable by dialysis 
and normally they are excreted either by glomerular filtration or the tubular secretion in the nephron. Next slide, please. So the mechanism of action we already discussed. So they are homodimers, but they are uh, functionally configured as conformal heterodimers. So one monomer of the Cox enzyme, one part is heme bound, which is a catalytic subunit. The other part is non heme bound, which is the allosteric subunit. And most NSAIDs, they inhibit the catalytic subunit of the COX-1 and COX-2. And principal therapeutic effects as well as the adverse effects. Both of them derive from the ability to inhibit the prostaglandin synthesis. That's why we paid so much emphasis in the initial slides. Next slide, please. So coming on to therapeutic uses, as we all know, they are antipyretic in nature, they're anti-inflammatory in nature, and they're analgesic properties except the paracetamol or acetaminophen, which is devoid of anti-inflammatory activity. They are effective against pain of low to moderate intensity and co-administration of opioids can reduce the overall opioid dose requirement, which we commonly do in the OPD at our setup. And low dose aspirin has also been proven to be cardioprotective in high risk patients. So this is a form of secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease and cerebral vascular disease. And uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen is commonly used as an antipyretic in numerous situations. Next slide, please. So the coming on to the adverse effects of NSAID therapy. Many of the toxic effects are related to their main mode of action, which we have discussed is the inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis. A number of factors increase the risk of adverse effects. The important thing we have to keep in mind clinically is the drug dose, the drug to drug interactions and the comorbidities of the patient which we are assessing. And NSAID adverse effects related hospital admissions, they account for 11 to 12 percent of all drug related adverse drug re uh, reaction hospital admissions. So a significant amount is contributed by only NSAID adverse effect. And minimizing the toxicity depends upon a thorough patient evaluation. And we have to thoroughly evaluate the patient for the comorbidities he has for the drugs they are already taking, whether they are prescription or non-prescription drugs, so that we can further reduce the risk of developing the toxicity by these drugs. Next slide, please. So the system which we'll be dealing with is the gastrointestinal system effects, the renal system, the cardiovascular system, the hepatic system, the pulmonary system, the hematological system, and the dermatological system also. So we'll be covering in short all these topics in the subsequent slides. Next slide, please. So when talking about NSAIDs and GIT, the important uh, adverse effects we need to keep in mind are dyspepsia, peptic ulcer disease, and GI bleeding. So uh, whenever a patient comes to us, we have to assess the risk of gastrointestinal toxicity. If the patient already has the one of these features, which are mentioned in the table, for example, Prior history, of a, uh, prior history of a GI event, for example, known case of ulcer or a GI hemorrhage history, or if it's an elderly patient with age more than 60 years, if we are prescribing a baseline high dose of an NSAID for the respective indication, or the patient is taking drugs like glucocorticoids, antiplatelet agents, anticoagulants, or we are uh, uh, giving NSAIDs for a chronic use to main the, manage the chronic pains, or the patient has an untreated pylori infection, which promotes gastritis and promotes ulceration. So these factors have to be, must to be kept in mind while prescribing an NSAID so that we can beforehand only uh, prevent the GI toxicity. Otherwise, also it will alter the normal physiology and a normal patient with no side effects, no prior history can also have these dangers. But if the person has already these features, one of these features, we have to be very careful while prescribing these drugs to this person. Next slide, please. So mucosal damage by aspirin and other NSAIDs, which is a primarily a consequence of the inhibition of COX-1 in the upper GIT. So it reduces the mucosal generation of protective prostaglandins like PGE2, which I've already talked about in the physiological overview. So we have to uh, like, take strategies to avoid mucosal damage. So even if we have to use NSAIDs, we have to use uh, those NSAIDs which have minimal effects on the COX-1, which are the predominant COX-2 selective drugs, or prescribe an NSAID with a proton pump inhibitor and or a H2 blocker like a renitidine. 
so these strategies are effective in patients but the downside to these are that they are expensive and may not be cost effective and especially cox2 inhibitors we later come on in the subsequent slides that they are associated with a high risk of increased cardiovascular disease so they have a gastro less effect on the gastrointestinal damage but they can do a cardiovascular damage so then we have to weigh the drug accordingly that risk versus benefit what is the uh, patient really deserves and said or we can manage with some other drug if they have pre existing risk factors next slide please so coming on to the nsaids and the renal system so non selective nsaids have important adverse effects like they can uh, lead to the development of acute renal failure due to renal vasoconstriction we'll come into the mechanism later they can uh, underlying hypertension can be worsened by these drugs and various fluid and electrolyte abnormalities can be seen which include hyperkalemia hyponatremia fluid retention edema so if your patient has these risk factors like a prior history of existing glomerular disease or a history of renal insufficiency like it's a ckd patient or a post transplant patient renal transplant patient or a documented case of renal artery stenosis in our setting we also see patients with severe hypercalcemia for example multiple myeloma patient or patients with head and neck malignancies presenting in visceral crisis the states of effective volume depletion like heart failure and cirrhosis and true volume depletion like gi water losses renal water losses and concurrent use of medications which include medications like diuretics ace inhibitors angiotensin receptor blockers cancinurin inhibitors taken for other indications so if your patient has one of these risk factors you have to be extremely careful while prescribing nsaid to these patients as they can be very deteriorating for these patients they can do more harm than benefit so next slide please this is the diagram which is showing how the prostaglandins maintain the uh, intramedullary blood flow so they dilate the uh, uh, efferent arteriole so certain conditions like cirrhosis heart failure chronic kidney disease and the hypovolemic states which we mentioned previously they promote renal vasoconstriction and renal hypoperfusion but these prostaglandins what they do is they dilate the efferent arteriole and thus maintain a normal gfr in these compromised kidneys so here they are acting to preserve renal blood flow and gfr by decreasing the pre glomerular resistance in a normal kidney this effect won't, won't be much evident and won't be much needed also but when it's a compromised kidney and on top of that we are giving nsaids so now these endogenous prostaglandins will be blocked and since when they are blocked and they were critical in maintaining the gfr in that kidney so giving these uh, nsaids can thereby precipitate an acute kidney injury which in these patients can precipitate a renal failure and can be even fatal for them so it's very important next slide please so we have to learn how to prevent nsaid induced renal injury so nsaid induced hemodynamically mediated acute kidney injury it may be prevented by avoiding nsaids in the first place and we have talked about the high risk patients already and chronic use must be avoided if at all possible with an gfr of less than 30 ml per minute we have to use very cautiously in gfr 30 to 89 ml per minute with other risk factors like heart failure cirrhosis and nephrotic syndrome and if patients are going for some investigations which require a radio contrast administration so we have to decrease the uses of nsaids or totally avoid it because it can increase the incidence of uh, radio contrast induced nephropathy next slide please so this table shows the various syndromes which we have already talked about it can cause uh, acute kidney injury apart from it it can cause interstitial nephritis uh, nephrotic syndrome hyponatremia the hyperkalemia the worsening of the hypertension acute papillary necrosis and analgesic nephropathy with chronic use it has also been implicated in increase of ureoepithelial malignancy like renal cell carcinoma next slide please so nsaids and cardiovascular system so the use of nsaids including these cox2 selective ones is associated with an increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events like mi uh, heart failure and stroke 
again in these uh, categories we have patient related risk factors and drug related risk factors so the patient related risk factors in a cardiovascular system include prior history of cardiovascular events like a known case of mi or a heart failure history of systemic inflammatory disorder like sle or rheumatoid arthritis the older age is a risk factor in every comorbidity history of hypertension diabetes smoking male gender whereas the drug related issues will include chronic usage high doses predominantly cox2 selectiveness and drug drug interactions for example usage of aspirin we'll come on to the details later next slide please so due to relatively high baseline risk for cardiovascular events in patients with established adds a disease we have to avoid and assess particularly long term administration as most of these patients are already taking one antithrombotic agent for example aspirin clopidogrel so combining nsaids with aspirin it number one potentiates the gi bleeding risk and number two it also competes with aspirin at the cox binding site and it will also decrease the antiplatelet need action of the aspirin which will be detrimental for the patient he'll have a higher risk of gi bleeding plus he'll have a higher risk of secondary mi also if continued for a long time so we can use estaminophen or opioids which can be alternative analgesics to avoid the cardiovascular risks associated with nsaid use if the anti inflammatory effects are not required in that particular patient next slide please so uh, talking about the effects on liver hepatotoxicity can occur with most nsaids in the first 6 to 12 weeks but it resolves within 4 to 8 weeks of discontinuation and elevations of transaminases are the most commonly clinical lab abnormality which are seen the overall risk is very less 1 to 8 percent per 100000 patient years and is mainly due to hepatocellular injury and liver injury occurs in 17% adults with unintentional estaminophen overdose next slide please talking about the pulmonary effects there are two important entities we need to keep in mind number one is the bronchospasm which is relatively common and number two is the very rare pulmonary infiltrates with eosinophilia the bronchospasm can be precipitated by non selective nsaids and may exacerbate the underlying asthma and such patients are found to have a history of pre existing chronic rhinosinusitis so with a patient with such history we have to be careful and we have to keep in mind that nsaids can precipitate a bronchospasm in these patients whereas the very rare syndrome of pulmonary infiltrates it presents with fever cough dyspnea and infiltrates on x ray and a peripheral eosinophilia it may be uh, treated by glucocorticoids if it's symptomatic and the need arises next slide please the hematological uh, effects can also be categorized into two categories the expected ones and the unexpected ones which are very rare again so the expected ones uh, we know that the antiplatelet effect by the cyclooxygenase inhibition which is therapeutically used in by a low dose aspirin or it can also be a side effect we have to prevent giving nsaids if the baseline platelet count is low or is expected to be low in the coming days for example uh, if a patient is already on anticoagulants or post chemotherapy like that so there is a increased risk of bleeding when combined with anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents and very rarely they are also being implicated in development of neutropenia and aplastic anemia but it is a very rare occurrence next slide please now in skin reactions are divided into rare cases of life threatening reactions and common relatively common cases which are non life threatening so the rare ones are the toxic epidermolysis and the steven johnson syndrome which are divided based on the body surface area more than 30 we call it ten and less than 10% of body surface area we call it sjs the non life threatening are the fixed eruptions the photoallergenic eruptions the urticaria and small vessel vasculitis i have some drawings also next slide please so these are the uh, the uh, first two diagrams they show the toxic epidermal necrolysis which is um, identified by widespread erythema we see vesiculations sloughing of the skin and patients should be treated like burns patients and they are at high risk for sepsis dehydration the second case is the more common scene which is the uh, local 
photo allergic reaction here the patient was wearing a socks after application of the NSAID gel so the uh, area below the covered by the socks was protected and the above area we can clearly see allergic reaction is a clear line of demarcation next slide please so NSAID reactions are classified into type a and type b reactions which are type a are the 80 percent of the cases which are commoner and which do not require advanced methods to diagnose for example abdominal pain dyspepsia gi bleeding so until proven otherwise if the patient is on NSAIDs, we have to attribute these reactions to the NSAID. whereas the type b reactions are rare they are immunologically mediated so out of type b also there are one category which are common and one category which are much rarer so the frequent ones are cross-reactive among the various NSAIDs. If one can do, the other can also do. Whereas the true drug allergies are only single agent induced allergies. So these include entities like NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease or NSAID exacerbated cutaneous disease, NSAID induced urticaria, angioedema. Whereas the much rarer are single NSAID induced urticaria, single NSAID induced delayed reaction, so this is just an overview. We won't go into much details about these reactions. Next slide, please. So we would like to summarize. Anujamam, please uh, summarize. And then we'll move on to the case study. So uh, to summarize, um, the organ systems that were, uh, Karanveer has very well uh, actually uh, said that all the organ systems that were affected by NACIDs, we need to keep in mind dose reduction or complete avoid, completely avoiding NACIDs may also be important in some high-risk patients. So uh, patients, especially patients with uh, renal disease, uh, you need to uh, take care. And uh, as well as for patients with GI uh, bleeding or patients with DVT, patient, uh, and especially because we all are dealing predominantly with cancer patients, which is a prothrombotic state. So we need to keep in mind if a patient is there with DVT or a um, high risk of um, embolism or um, prothrombotic state, you need to avoid COX-2 inhibitors. Okay, uh, can we go ahead? So we'll talk about a case study. Uh, uh, so people can also interact and write in the chat box in the subsequent questions if they want. So it's a case about a lady, Mrs. AJ, 55 year old lady. She presented to the OPD with complaints of generalized backache since the last four months. It occasionally radiates to the bilateral lower limbs. She tells that the pain initially responded by taking combiflam, which is a combination of ibuprofen and paracetamol, and sometimes zerodol also, acyclofenac plus paracetamol. She was taking it from the local chemist herself since the last three months, initially once a day, but now it, uh, she has to take them three to four times a day. Still, the pain relief is inadequate and has now started in the shoulders as well. Since the last two weeks, she complains that she has suddenly started noticing the swelling of both her feet and her eyes also relatively appear swollen than before. The pain is continuous. It is aching, increased by movements, not relieved by lying down. She is also uh, having pain in weight bearing over her right lower limb. Does not complain of any breathlessness, chest pain, palpitations, syncope, orthopnea, numbness, or verbal bladder complaints as of now. She is a known case of diabetes mellitus and hypertension since 10 years. And she suffered a myocardial infarction two years ago for which a stenting of the LED was done. And currently she's taking ecosprin. She's taking lisinopril for the diabetes. She's taking metformin and glimipride and atorvastatin for her dyslipidemias. So this is the case study. We'll move on to the first question. Next slide, please. So what should be our concerns from the history of this patient? If people want to write, they can write. Can we just go ahead because we are short of time. Okay. So next slide, please. So the history of uh, this patient, the issues are baseline patient has diabetes and heart disease. She's taking antiplatelet agents. She's taking ACE inhibitors but taking over-the-counter NSAIDs, which uh, Neetu may have mentioned. And so uh, regarding this, significant drug interactions uh, is a possibility with the potential to increase adverse GI, renal side effects, and decreased efficacy of aspirin. Progressive pedal edema and facial puffiness may be a sign of renal dysfunction 
and it may be also precipitating of a congestive heart failure or it may be due to low albumin levels so we have to find out that also she is using more than one nsaid acyclofenac also is being used and she is also using uh, these ibuprofen so increased chances of again adverse drug reactions exists and she is giving a history of generalized back pain and axial skeletal pain which is non responsive to nsaids unrelieved by rest so this is to be treated as a red flag sign of pain which may or may not be benign in nature and needs very urgent evaluation of its etiology so that it can be managed properly so the next question so what should be done in the workup of this patient so next slide please so the basic workup include a complete blood count which in her case showed a low hemoglobin and a decreased mean corpuscular volume which we can interpret as anemia of nutritional deficiency or anemia of chronic disease also she uh, we got her renal test done she showed raised urea creatinine and calcium also was raised so the renal injury can be here pre renal or a nsaid induced renal injury or a hypercalcemia induced renal injury so hypercalcemia can also be due to an underlying malignancy we have to suspect that in this case the lft showed raised alp which may be suggestive of a pathological fracture in this scenario and a reversal of the albumin to globulin ratio so it may be think thought of as suggestive of presence of abnormal proteins in the serum or there may be a albumin loss we have to see the absolute values we got a painful site x ray skeletal survey done and it was suggestive of multiple lytic lesions in the axial skeleton along with vertebral collapse so it is suggestive of bone marrow involvement and pathological fracture and uh, we have seen that she has hypercalcemia she has renal dysfunction she has anemia she has bone pain so this is the crab criteria clinically which is pointing towards multiple myeloma so now we have to do the protein electrophoresis in the serum and urine and the free light chain assay all of which were pointing towards m band presence and kappa light chain were raised so it came out to be as a multiple myeloma the bone marrow biopsy flow and aspiration were uh, suggestive of cd19 and 56 positive cells so myeloma was confirmed and elevated beta microglobulin level is uh, suggestive of a highly aggressive disease and we categorized myeloma according to the rss staging so the next step so what should be done for the non responding pain so since we have found out the underlying etiology now it becomes clearer to address the issue of the pain in this patient next slide please so as discussed in the previous slides here in this case nsaid induced renal injury hypercalcemia and free light chain induced tubular damage all of these may be responsible in different proportions for the renal dysfunction of this patient to improve her symptoms we have to stop all her nephrotoxic agents she should be treated with opioids preferably iv fentanyl which is renal safe acetaminophen which is also renal safe and investigations requiring contrast administration which we mentioned previously to delay nephropathy must be delayed accordingly adequate hydration and diuresis with loop diuretics should be done to lower her calcium levels which may be also lead to, leading to improvement in her renal function so early initiation of definitive therapy for myeloma should be undertaken once the renal function improves to prevent recurrence of the metabolic abnormalities otherwise you will treat those and if you don't treat the myeloma they will again reoccur and serial measurements of the serum creatinine level needs to be done so that we can rule out whether it was an acute kidney injury or it has been progressing to a chronic kidney disease if it's a ckd then subsequently also when we prescribe anesthets will be need to be very careful for this patient next slide please so we'll come to the important individual drugs i won't go into much detail these are some of the common drugs which we use and we should know some things about them and then we'll conclude this slide next slide please aspirin we have talked about it attains the plasma concentration in 1 hour it's chiefly 80 to 90% protein bound the metabolite is salicylic acid and 2 to 3 hours is the half life the antiplatelet dose is 40 to 80 mg per day and it's rarely or not at all used for pain or fever now so permanent cox1 inhibition in platelets is the reason for its use as antiplatelet agent and we have talked about the adverse gi side effects and an increased clotting time one more thing we need to address is the ray syndrome in children which is fulminant uh, liver failure 
developing with aspirin use so it's avoided in children at all costs next slide so aspirin irreversible i talked about it's the only irreversible inhibitor because it covalently acetylates the catalytic subunits of the cox1 and 2 whereas no other nsaid does this so platelets since the platelets are a nucleate they don't have a nucleus so the cox enzyme inhibition lasts for the last, last lifetime of the platelet and is cumulative with re repeated doses 8 to 12 days are needed for platelets to recover after aspirin has been stopped but even a partially recovered platelet pool may allow sufficient hemostatic integrity for some type of elective procedures and their platelets we have to uh, this is an important point that they are acetylated in the portal circulation itself even before the aspirin reaches the liver it starts doing its action and thus platelets are so sensitive to aspirin even at low doses next slide please so diclofenac uh, it's a short half life 1.2 to 2 hours mostly protein bound and 50 mg 8 hourly is the standard dose or 75 mg 12 hourly is the standard dose it's 50% orally bioavailable can be even used as a topical gel and of thalamic solution also it accumulates in the synovial fluid so therapeutic half life is prolonged next slide please coming on to estaminophen it also has a peak plasma concentration time of half an hour to one hour it is less protein bound than other NSAIDs, only 20 to 50% bound. The half life is two hours. The doses, the maximum dose can go up to four grams per day. For children, it's 10 to 15 mg per kg body weight. The oral availability is excellent. It acts as the peroxide site of the enzyme and produces a toxic metabolite, which can cause massive liver macrosis. Next slide, please. So severe liver damage can occur in 90% of patients uh, taking estaminophen if overdose occurs. And these are the concentrations. Uh, to prevent this overdose, uh, we can uh, give four hours, uh, within four hours, we can give activated charcoal, which reduces the absorption of this drug. And n acetylcysteine is used as an antidote. It can be an indication even for liver transplantation as it can cause fulminant liver failure in overdose cases. Next slide, please. Ibuprofen is another drug which we commonly use. So the peak plasma concentration is uh, attained in two hours for a tablet form and 45 minutes for a liquid form. Extensively protein bound and uh, half-life varies according to the age of the patient. We can see for adults, it's two to four hours. For children, it's one to two hours. But for a premature infant, it's up to days. So 23 to 75 hours can be there. It may increase the risk of aseptic meningitis and is excreted in the breast milk in minimal amounts and also accumulates in the synovial fluid. Next slide, please. Again, uh, ketorolac is also extensively protein bound. The plasma concentration is attained in half an hour to one hour and the half-life is four to six hours. It can be given IM, IV, oral or intranasally also. It is a potent analgesic, but it doesn't have much of an anti-inflammatory action. And its use is limited to five days or less for acute pain and widely used in management of post-operative pain and ophthalmic uh, surgeries. Next slide, please. The pyroxicam is a, um, uh, the drug which was having a long half-life. So it has 50 hours of half-life. It's not indicated for acute pain or fever. Long half-life will permit once daily dosing. It is excreted in breast milk but it has a slower onset of action. Next slide, please. So, uh, Celecoxib is a uh, selective COX-2 inhibitor. It is also extensively protein bound and has half-life of 10 to 11 hours. And the elderly patients may have a two high, two-fold higher blood levels of the drug. So we have to prescribe them very carefully in these patients, especially if they have an underlying cardiovascular history. Chronic use is also seen to decrease the bone mineral density and it confers a risk of MI and stroke. Next slide, please. Etoricoxib is also a similar thing and it's used for managing arthritis uh, pain, both inflammatory and non-inflammatory. It's also a selective COX-2 inhibitor. Next slide, please. So cancer pain management, use of estaminophen and NSAIDs. We have seen that in uh, clinical observations, 
they may be useful in patients with bone pain or pain that is related to inflammatory lesions and they have well established role in the treatment of cancer pain when used as single agents and combining with opioids they permit a reduction in the opioid dose we mentioned already so a trial may be considered in any patient who has mild to moderate chronic cancer pain after considering the likelihood of benefit the adverse effects which will cause and the patient's disease profile and the cost and burden associated with prolonged treatment we have to weigh all these factors to minimize gi toxicity celecoxib is a good option but again comes at the cost of increased cardiovascular risk to minimize cardiovascular toxicity naproxen is a good option but the risk of gi toxicity will be higher with these drugs uh, next is so emerging new information about nsaids apart from the conventional uses they are also being now found implicated in inducing induction of uh, tumor cell apoptosis and down regulation of epidermal growth factor receptor also found in attenuation of neoangiogenesis and disruption of the inflammatory milieu which is necessary for the tumor cell proliferation so uh, many organizations our organization also uses celecoxib as a component of the oral metronomic therapy and aspirin has also been used in many trials for preventing solid tumors like colorectal cancer the ad aspirin trial is one of those studies in which aspirin is added and it has been found to reduce the metastasis the metastasis of the tumor and in prevention of the secondary tumors so these are the new emerging uses next slide please so the take home messages concluding this ppt so nsaids are one of the most commonly prescribed drugs we have time and again emphasized on this so so common these drugs are that it is very easy to be overlooked if we don't take it uh, if you don't pay particular attention so attention should be paid to the patient's medical history both uh, prescription and over the counter drugs adrs of this drug class should be kept in mind according with the comorbidities of the recipient to promote safe and rational prescribing and prescribing drugs we must say that it requires skill but prescription after weighing all the risk and benefit requires clinical expertise and experience thank you so much uh thank you karan karan veer brilliant talk anuja there are many questions and we have 10 minutes and you can take five more minutes because we started late so please go ahead with the discussion okay ma'am uh so thank you so much karan veer uh, he's actually given a excellent talk uh, we will be taking questions um uh, so there is one question from neetu how does nsaids cause mi is it because of decrease in anti platelet uh, action of aspirin or direct cox2 inhibition so uh, if you have seen the slides in the physiology slides uh, platelets express both cox uh, cyclooxygenase as well as uh, uh, sorry uh, through the cyclooxygenase mechanism uh, both thromboxin and um, pgi2 that is the prostacyclins are uh, produced in the platelets now uh, they have antagonistic actions thromboxin is a vasoconstrictor and it promotes platelet aggregation whereas prostacyclin which is pgi2 it is a vasodilator and it inhibits platelet aggregation so now in a uh, physiological state the uh, platelet aggregation system it is kept in balance by a balance between these two uh, uh, substances the thromboxin a2 as well as the pgi2 now what happens in if you are giving um, uh, nsaids the non selective ones both are inhibited so still it remains in balance when you uh, give only a cox2 selective uh, inhibitor uh, the the balance is interrupted so then the cox the thromboxane which is produced by the cox1 enzyme only that is uninhibited whereas the prostacyclin which was inhibiting the platelet aggregation only that is inhibited so what happens is your balance is disrupted there is more of thromboxin a2 which is promoting the platelet aggregation and less of the prox, pros, uh, prostaglandin i2 which was inhibiting the platelet aggregation that is how it leads to a prothrombotic state next question there are questions uh, more questions lot of compliments are uh, what i what i will suggest archana please all the compliments send it to karanveer and anuja 
okay uh, okay there are there is i think uh, i think you have answered all the question in one this thing one la one need dr neena sablok asked that uh, those uh, aspirin causes lot of bruises or blood clots in the skin how do we monitor in the patient so aspirin actually it's causing uh, bruises and uh, blood clots because of the uh, actually aspirin is given for its anti platelet action we are not usually using aspirin for pain so uh, because due to the anti platelet action it is causing uh, bruises easy bruising because it's a blood thinner so if it is uh, it, it's a usual side effect but if it is more then uh, the patient has to see their cardiologist or go for platelet aggregation studies there are then there is yes uh, there is a comment which says in renal patients nefopam is a choice that was the paper which won second pr prize in the free paper category in ipicon that's wonderful a uh, morphine is still a choice in mild renal dysfunction in a supervised prescription yes we can morphine does not itself cause uh, renal toxicity it, it is dependent on renal system for its clearance so we can modify the doses or we can modify the regimen we can give a longer duration gap between the two doses uh, then there is also question question a few words on co prescription with ppis do you always co prescribe or only in the high risk thank you so because we are uh, in a palliative uh, patient um, in palliative medicine we are giving the patients the patients are going to be on a long term uh, analgesic therapy so we do prescribes either proton pump inhibitors or uh, h2 blockers then uh, can you suggest any standard textbook for palliative medicine ma'am uh, sushma ma'am can answer this yes ma'am what she is asking can you suggest any standard book for palliative medicine ah uh, there are three books which i recommend oxford test book of palliative medicine Pal palliative care formerly this is seventh edition has come and one is our own iapc test book of uh, basics in palliative care i think these three books are enough for any md student if they will read it properly so there are few more questions that what is the status uh -huh. ah sorry go ahead paracetamol is safe at 2 grams per day in mild hepatic dysfunction even in uh, paracetamol even in when you have a patient with encephalopathy and pain management is an issue we still say that less than 2 grams uh, can be given so uh, um, yes I, except for in patients with the uh, uh, paracetamol toxicity uh, paracetamol is quite a safe drug um then Safest is NSAID. Is Safest is NSAID. I would say, uh, like Karanveer has mentioned in the second last slide, I think so. Naproxen uh, is safe for uh, patients with uh, um, Karanveer. Is it for CV uh, cardiovascular yeah. or? Like uh, in in general, like we can't say which is the safest, but. after weighing all the risk factors only we can decide which is the safe and sid for that particular case so it's case to case basis we can't just like say point out that this class is safest so i can't pinpoint one drug but depending upon the comorbidities and all we can then weigh accordingly and then say which is safe for that particular patient okay so now the questions are over ibuprofen 2 ibuprofen has been shown to have uh, one of the uh, least uh, gi side effects so yes ibuprofen is safe i think i have taken all the questions is there anybody else uh, i have taken my all yes ma'am i have taken all the questions so thank you very much uh, anuja and karambir i think there are a lot of compliments and i will request arsana and nisha that they will send these compliments to you and uh, Doctor Raji is asking. Doctor Raji is asking whether I will excellent. Oh, okay, I will refer. Ah, she is just complimenting. So, ah, uh, uh, I I know it's it's going to be a tough task when a patient come with bony metastasis, and we know that anesthetics are only the one which is going to relieve the pain. It is going to be a tough task, but we have a solution. Ah, uh, opioids with paracetamol. If you will titrate properly, it will go ahead. always remember we have to have a feeling or principle in our mind 
that we should not harm our patient by giving wrong medication. NSAIDs are not wrong medication. NSAIDs are wonderful painkillers. But this lecture, you always remember, please, that how they relieve pain and how they cause side effects. So you have to balance the effect versus side effects. And always remember that we will not harm patient by giving extra dose or, or by not giving medication and remaining in pain. Many a times it is important that a, a, slug, a low dose of NSAIDs will give extraordinary pain relief. But here I would like to emphasize one more important thing that in many times you may come across with non-malignant pain and non-malignant pain, there is no other answer. And people write left and right NSAIDs and you must have seen so many rheumatoid arthritis patients land up in kidney injury and finally they land up in the kidney failure and they require renal transplant. So it is important that uh, in non-malignant patient, because you are a pain physician, people will come to you. So you should have a clear cut idea that what exactly I should offer. You cannot offer opioids left and right. You cannot offer, offer NSAIDs for a long term. So probably interventional pain management or non-pharmacological therapy will be the answer for non-malignant pain. And it is such a wonderful talk. It was such a wonderful talk, uh, Karanveer and Anuja. We are really proud of you that you have started a very important lecture with a very important, uh, in an in a excellent way. So everyone is very happy and uh, Dr. Rajshri uh, has given a lot of compliments and I think she's the se very senior most uh, and an excellent teacher. So uh, plus there are so many senior people plus junior, they are giving you compliments. So you should be proud that you have worked hard, but it was worth it. And people have learned how to use it and what are the ways we can prevent side effects and where should we be, be careful. Thank you very much.